invitation. Uh, Alessandro Mecchiore from the University of um, Sapienza and uh, I will uh, try to give a brief review on the current status, observational status of the cosmic neutrino background and uh, especially in view uh, of current tension, cosmological tension. So this talk was supposed to be given by Sinan Stad, so we couldn't uh, come here so in some way trying to give a serial talk, okay, but in some way it will be extremely different. So, okay, let me start with this uh, picture where we have uh, shown here the history of the universe. So you can see clearly the neutrino, this picture is made by particle that group in 2000. You see the neutrino? Here is the neutrino, eh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that Manus doesn't. <laughs> so, so they couldn't find uh, the Greek letter on the keyboard, probably. So this is why <laughs> we have all the neutrino. So this is the history of the universe, the thermal history of the universe. And uh, as you probably know, we have that in the primordial universe, neutrinos are uh, coupled by weak interaction with the primordial plasma. They decouple from the primordial plasma around the temperature of the one MeV, a few seconds after the Big Bang. And this epoch is extremely close to another epoch, which is uh, the Big Bang photosynthesis epoch. So they decouple just right before the Big Bang. And uh, so this is the primordial photosynthesis. And this is the, the, the neutrino decoupling here. So what we have, we are discussing here, are the neutrino after the decoupling. Around the temperature of a one electron volt, probably we have a before that we see neutrino around temperature, this temperature here, at least one species of neutrino is non relativistic, okay? And so neutrino, we know they have masses, and so they become from non relativistic to relativistic in, exactly in this region here, okay? So slightly before and up to that. So it's not clear when they are non relativistic, but this is why probably they are so important for cosmology because uh, they change from relativistic to relativistic exactly uh, in the, during the observable, observable universe. Okay, so they might affect the cosmic microwave and anisotropies and also the large scale uh, structure. <coughs> so, indeed, are the only particle that uh, we don't see, okay, they don't emit light, but they have an effect on the structure formation, and they are the only particle that actually we know they must exist. Okay, the dynamic matter and the uh, energy, we don't have uh, any direct uh, proof. And they are extremely important because they are very abundant. Okay, they contribute to the radiation in the early times, and uh, they might contribute to structure formation in the for the late times. And from the cosmological observables, we can infer information on the number of neutrinos, the neutrino properties, and the masses. So, uh, let's start with the relativistic neutrinos. Let me start with this uh, Stephen Pan's formula, which is the, the formula that we use in cosmology. Okay? So, the energy density in uh, relativistic particles is connected to the energy density in photons from the cosmic microwave ground by this uh, equation, where Nf is, uh, has several names, can be the effective neutrino number, the effective uh, number of, uh, of relativistic particles, what you want. In the standard model, where you have three active neutrinos, this number is 3.046. Now, <laughs> probably for those who don't know, we, don't, we have three neutrinos, we don't have 3.046 neutrinos. The point is that this formula is not correct, okay, because this formula assumes that instantaneous decoupling, where the, the decoupling takes some time, so there are some effects of this. So instead of changing the formula, okay, the cosmologists just change the number of neutrinos. Okay, so instead of three, we have 3.046. So the main point is that we can make an observation that constrains this uh, effective neutrino number. So if observation tells us its effective neutrino number is close to 3.046, it's a confirmation of the standard three neutrino framework. If it's larger than this number, then we might look at modifications. So <coughs> modification could be also in general relativity because it might be an effect of change in the upper rate. It can, it can mimic an uh, increase in the number of effective neutrino number, but essentially you have more realistic particles 
uh, an epoch, of course, you are measuring this number, so you might have axions, sterile neutrinos, uh, air reduct energy in some sense, okay? Uh, on the other hand, uh, you might have also this number less than 3.046, you might still have the three neutrinos, but probably the decoupling is non standard, okay? You might have some effect from inflation, from inflation rating that might change the neutrino decoupling, and so there are models where you actually do have this. Yes. Okay? Now, let me start with the uh, Big Bang into synthesis, and um, this is uh, all the, all the, uh, the oldest uh, cosmological uh, observables that, <laughs> that we have. Uh, essentially, uh, thanks to the Big synthesis, we can make prediction on the amount of uh, primordial helium and uh, of other, other vital elements like deuterium. And the point is that these uh, observations, these, uh, sorry, these, these abundances, uh, they, mm, they depend a lot on the, the baryon abundance, as we all know, but also they depend on the, the number of uh, effective neutrinos. In this case, it is actually the number of effective neutrinos because you have that increase in this number, of course, increase the upper rate, but also increase the neutrino density during BBN. So you have also effects from, from the several weak interaction because you have a larger number. Okay, so when we discuss the uh, constraints on this number from BBF, we are really increasing the number of neutrinos. So, so what we can do now? What we have to do essentially, we have two parameters: the baryon density and uh, uh, the neutrino number. You see, this is the same helium for two neutrinos up to seven neutrinos. If you change the prediction of helium, so what we have to do is to make uh, a measurement of at least. Uh, Two light elements, for example, helium and deuterium. Okay? So, just to break the jets. So, if you measure helium and deuterium, this is one of the, um, let's say, recent constraints by Isotope et al. in 2014. And you look at the constraints on this plane, you have the neutrino number, and you have the baryon density. You see these are the constraints coming from deuterium. There is a perfect degeneracy between uh, an F and omega BF squared, and these are the constraints from helium measured by Izotov from uh, uh, helium in extragalactic H2 regions. Okay. And you see, you <laughs> combine the two, you get these uh, uh, contour plots, and you get this number. According to Izotov et al. 2014, they got the neutrino number 3.5 plus minus 4.2, which is uh, an impressive detection, if you like, of the cosmic neutrino background of more than 17 standard deviations. Okay, so we really need this cosmic neutrino to explain these elements. But there have been another revised version of, the, of this data by Aver and Sibo. They did the analysis and they found a lower value for NF combining a different value of helium with the same measurement of deuterium, you see the neutrino number is slightly smaller now than 3, 2.85 plus minus 0.28. And this is, means a detection of 10 standard deviation. The most recent one is by the Matsumoto et al. in 2022. You have the neutrino number is now 2.37 plus minus 0.2, something like this. Another impressive detection, now 9 standard deviation. You might Look at that, I remove a one exclamation point <laughs> <laughs> each of them. So I don't know in the future you could go to one of things like this. But okay, you see that essentially uh, is extremely powerful, okay, with the BBM because it's telling us look, at that time we need some neutrinos, okay, because otherwise you cannot produce the right abundances. Now, here's the table, you see this is the a uh, constraint from uh, Izotope in 2014, and this is by Matsumoto, and you see there is some trend, okay, in this measurement, and uh, the helium is going lower and lower, and uh, let's say there is a tension, okay, at the level of two standard deviations. So I said, oh, this is tension, maybe I should talk about this tension, this is a, a conference on tensions. Then uh, I went, uh, okay, sorry, this just to explain to you, <laughs> sorry again, because I had to finished my lecture yesterday night at the <laughs> conference dinner, so I apologize for this. But in essentially, what I'm saying the following, if you have this instant of data, you have an F larger than the standard value, the standard value is more or less here, and the data now is going towards a small value of this F. So I was quite excited to say, maybe I can use this data, then these are the, uh, how you recover the uh, helium abundance, 
essentially you measure the helium in, in uh, galaxies uh, and you have these, uh, these lines, these measurements, and you extrapolate the value at zero metallicity. Okay? So these are all the measurement functions of the million metallicity. You extrapolate at zero metallicity. So you see the data points of this extrapolation. Okay? <laughs> so there is a, a little bit of scatter. So when I saw this, I would say, mm, I'm not believe. So I, I don't think I can believe really that there is an act larger than three because you see the scatter. Then I saw the paper by Hammer, okay? And again, <laughs> this is the scatter, okay, of the data points and they extrapolate and here is the value. Okay. So this value comes from extrapolating these data points. And again, I am a bit skeptical. Okay, I don't work on the big bang synthesis. But I see, okay, a lot of scatter here. So before claiming a modified general activity model, okay, from this data, I would be quite careful. Then I say, but well, let's look at the really the last one, and this is the situation, okay? <laughs> so this is the data point. The final extrapolation this is the original data point. So really, uh, I, I'm a bit skeptical, but this, okay, I concluded that for the moment, uh, I don't care. I prefer to sleep for 50 years, and in 50 years, look again at the situation and see what is the value of the helium. So for sure we have a value of, um, of the neutrino background. For sure we need the neutrino background, but the exact value from the band synthesis is still uh, a bit tricky to, to the right. Okay, so let's move finally to the cosmic micro background. And uh, how I can measure the neutrino background to the cosmic micro background? This is interesting, no? Because we are using light to constrain the neutrino. Okay, so it's still uh, an interesting point. So first of all, the effect of the neutrino background is a change in what is called the early integrated Saxon effect. Essentially, you have the gravitational potential that is constant during matter domination, but it varies during uh, the universe dominated by a cosmological constant or radiation. If the universe is dominated by a cosmological constant, the variation of the gravitational potential induces this. This is the late integrated Saxon. So it's an additional anisotropy that cross correlates with the, the, the galaxy distribution. On the other hand, the neutrino change the amount of radiation on the last scattering surface, so they change the air integrated Saxon. And so this is the change you see in, uh, in the air integrated Saxon by changing the number of neutrinos. Okay, you go from 3 to 5 to 6. So you have a slight increase of anisotropy around L100. Okay, remind you, this is the boundary power spectrum of 100, is more or less like here. Okay, it's close to the first peak. So this is the first effect. Then there is a, this more important effect that has been, uh, um, let's say, uh, clarified by Du Kaiser et Knox in 2003. And it will take me half an hour to understand it, but <laughs> it's quite clear in the sense that if you change the neutrino effective number, you change the expansion rate and the combination. And so you change two important scales on the last scattering surface. One is the damping scale, okay, which depends on H. Here, you can do this is a, a diffusion damping, so it goes like square. So you have a R square, it goes directly into and you have H here. On the other hand, you have another scale, which is the sound horizon scale, and you have a H, no square here, okay. So imagine that you do a parameter analysis. Uh, you need to keep fixed the sound horizon that is given by this formula. So you need to fix this. This goes like h to the minus 1, more or less. So it means that the angular distance must go like uh, h to the minus 1. So if you do this, you have uh, now that this angular scale of the damping. This thing goes like 1 over square root of h. This goes like 1 over h. Sorry if I'm going fast, but if you read again this slide, you, <laughs> but, but, but you, will, you will catch it. So I have you that this uh, uh, angular scale of the damping goes like uh, the square root of h, okay, of the upper parameter. And so it means uh, that uh, if you uh, increase h, you uh, increase uh, this uh, angular scale, and so you decrease uh, the small angular scale. So you see here these are models where you fix the sound horizon, okay? So you want to pick uh, in the angular spectrum in the correct position, and you increase the number of neutrino, and you see you decrease the, the anisotropies on small angular scale. So this means that if your experiment goes to small angular scale, you can break the degeneracy 
and have a good determination of the neutrino number from the cosmic microgram. So let's look at the dimension. The dimension was made by me in, uh, in 2000, <laughs> adopted the dimension to an upper limit, where you see that NF was less than 13. Then uh, uh, the first uh, results from that, the map actually down to 7, you have an NF larger than 2.7, probably you would remember different values because at that time they were also combining uh, with large scale structure, etc. etc. I'm just showing here the CMB only constraints. Okay? So let's say the first indication for the neutrino breakdown from CMB comes for sure from the Arduma, okay? This must be larger than 2.7. Then people started to include um, data from other data sets like WMAP7 plus after the CT at the epoch, that epoch, okay, that cosmological epoch around 2013. And so you see that was larger than 3.4. Uh, then we had the results from Planck. The first that received this of Planck was uh, only temperature data and the polarization was from WMAP, okay, if you remember. And they were showing a value of 3.5. Okay, and, uh, by, and adding to WMAP uh, and Planck, uh, the uh, WC11 from Sloan uh, and the results from the Hubble Space Telescope, but well, you start to say, well, well, you, you are combining Hubble, uh, <laughs> read the data from RIS uh, with CMB, that, that time was possible, okay, because at that time, okay, <laughs> you had the compatibility between uh, the, the data sets. And the results is an F 3.7. In fact, back then, in 2013, these are the results. This is Planck plus the R11 plus DAO, okay? And you had a very good compatibility with the H0 around 73, okay? Just with a slightly larger value of an F, okay? So it was possible. At the time, there was a slight, already some tension level between the 2 and 3 sigma, between the CMD and uh, the uh, measurement of the upper constant from Seibitz, okay? Like 10 years ago. But that could have been resolved, and people say, no, it's not possible, but an extra background of the mystic particles. Now, let's look now at the most recent data from Planck, and I want to be very clear on this. When you say the Planck data, you're actually referring to four data sets. Okay? You have uh, uh, these data sets here, which are the anisotropies on large angular scale, and uh, you have to treat them differently from the rest because of longer shell. In this region, okay? Because this is temperature square, so it goes like a Gaussian to square, so it's not Gaussian, okay? If you want to recover the anisotropy here, you have to uh, use a different method. So the second the data set is the anisotropy in this region, and there is uh, from something called bleak, so uh, small angular, sorry, large angular scale temperature, small angular scale temperature to that set, and then you have the third data set is the uh, cross correlation temperature polarization on a small angular scale and the polarization on small angular scale. Okay, they are in the same code. Now, we don't use this because it's longer. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I did the bad collaboration. I can just tell you that you see there are these data points that don't follow the theory, so we don't uh, look like them. Okay, so we don't, uh, these data points are not used, but what we use are these data points of the polarization at very uh, large angular scale, and uh, that is also more difficult because of the foregrounds, okay? So uh, this is another uh, data point, that data set called low E, okay? So if this is low L, this is a plic temperature I, uh, at the small angular scale, a plic temperature polarization small angular scale, and then uh, this is a symbol, okay? So why I'm saying this? Because so we have these four data sets. So let's take so only the anisotropy on temperature. Just take temperature, and this is the result. You have the neutrino number is 4.5, okay, and there is a, a very big degeneracy with the, the upper constant. The upper constant from these two data sets can be easily compatible with the upper constant measurement. Okay. So when you then claim a, a compatibility between the CMB and uh, the, the current result of this uh, is because uh, it's not from temperature, essentially, what I'm saying. Okay, the temperature data is, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, in agreement with the higher value of the uh, upper constant, especially if you value the neutral number. Now, let's just add this data set, and you see 
The Newtonian number is now perfectly consistent with the standard expectation, and the upper cost are now dropped significantly. This is a 68% confidence level, because I'm considering this. So 66.5 plus minus 2. So just adding this does it change things completely, and people say, because I'm breaking the genesis. Okay. And if I finally <coughs> consider the full data set, I have, okay, this result, uh, sorry, this 95% confidence level, neutrino number now is slightly less than three, okay, and this is, uh, means that uh, even if you consider uh, the neutrino number, you are not reaching agreement with, an, an extra neutrino number, you're not really reaching, reaching agreement with the, with the least value. So let me see. Okay, I still have uh, yeah. 40 minutes. No, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm using the, <laughs> the chairman is sleeping, so. Okay, anyway. So this result, okay, if you take the full data from Planck and uh, you extend the number of parameters, because that was just lambda CTM plus this neutrino number. But you, you, you also vary not only uh, the neutrino number, but vary altogether also the equation of state of the energy, the running, and then some the neutrino mass. And you say, data, please tell me, okay, how I can solve <laughs> the uh, tension. If you consider in this parameter space, you see this plot here, you can combine, okay, essentially, plan plus that was the real results in 2019 and essentially if you have a W less than minus 1 okay you can solve the tension but of course if you add the O this is uh, still a problem but in any case even in this uh, extremely large parameter space the neutrino number is here okay it's pretty stable so essentially if you just consider this data set there is no way you can uh, solve the upper tension including an extra neutrino number but the point here, uh, uh, why, why this uh, polarization data is so strong in uh, uh, killing the possibility as a solution of a four neutrino? Uh, first of all, the TA data breaks the genesis, and also the polarization that the TE data breaks the genesis, because essentially we don't have uh, any integrated sax group in polarization. Okay? So essentially, it's every signal in polarization that is degenerate with other parameters in temperature is not anymore there when you look at the polarization. So essentially, the adding polarization breaks the genesis. And secondly, uh, we have that this lower polarization is uh, essentially lower than previously thought. Essentially, if you look at the Planck uh, constraints on the optical depth, this is connected to the amount of polarization on large angular scale. You see, you go from uh, the release in 2013 from 0.09 to the latest result, it's at 0.055, more or less. So you have a shift during uh, the time, in five years, you have a shift of about 2.2 sigma, okay? So there is a variation, the only thing I would say, big variation in all the Planck uh, that there is, is uh, on this optical depth. So why a lower optical depth <laughs> doesn't uh, uh, let you to increase the number of neutrinos? Because if you go and look uh, at what is the best fit model that explains the uh, Hubble uh, tension with uh, uh, a free neutrino number, this is, you see, you have here 3.7 neutrino, and the upper parameter in this model is uh, 73, it's just taking the temperature data, so you don't use polarization, the temperature data can uh, explain, uh, let's say, the Hubble tension very well with uh, uh, something about 3.7, I would say, also 4 neutrinos. The only problem is that you need, uh, essentially, an Emerson's large spectrum. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's a beautiful model where the extra physics is just one neutrino, you don't need inflation, <laughs> you're just an Emerson's large spectrum. <laughs> so, it's, uh, from the point of view of theory, maybe it's slightly simpler, if you like, depends on, on uh, <laughs> what you think. But uh, this uh, simple model that would uh, solve the upper tension is uh, completely clear because in here you need a, a, a higher spectral index and this is, works against a uh, uh, low polarization on that general scale. So essentially, I go back now to this uh, data set and you see these are one, two, three, four data points. Okay? So you are excluding uh, this solution that you might like or not 
just because of four data points. So you mean four data points to four neutrinos, okay? So <laughs> just to tell you that uh, I like a lot, for example, the, the talk by Jan Poulain yesterday because he uh, made uh, this point very clear. <coughs> I, 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 we should be careful in taking the plant data because sometimes you have a part of the data that may be still affected by systematic. Now, the other tension is real. I'm not saying that if you remove these data points, you get 73 kilometers per second in Lambda CDM from plant. But what I'm saying is this kind of small systematics can prevent you in finding the correct theoretical solution to the upper tension in this data. Okay, that's my thought. Okay, so I hope uh, that you now believe a little bit less on CMB data. Okay, that's my goal. <laughs> so yesterday we had several people say you should not believe on the satellite data, okay, you should be careful on supernova data, and I'll say please be careful also towards PBM and CMB data, because systematics can be everywhere. So let's go back to the history of the universe. I told you that in this region we have the relativistic neutrinos, and this other region, one species after uh, the epoch of the CMB must be non relativistic. And uh, so, since there is this transition from non relativistic to relativistic in this region, we buy a uh, bound the neutrino mass. So the previous formula was for relativistic <coughs> neutrinos, now assume that non relativistic. We have this fantastic formula that relates the energy density now to the mass of the single neutrino species. Okay? What uh, is uh, really impressive is just you, if you put uh, a mass of seven electron volt, you close the universe. Okay? Since uh, the neutrinos decouple when they are relativistic, the relation between mass and energy density today is extremely powerful. You need just a very small mass to have uh, a very large energy density. Okay? It's contrary to that matter. Oh, cool, that so let's look at the constraints on the neutrino masses from Planck. In 2013, you have this 95% constraint on some neutrino masses, less than 0.5 electron volt. In 2015, less than 0.34 electron volt. In 2018, less than 0.26 electron volt. Okay, and that was really when we submitted the paper. People say, "Look, this is fantastic. I mean, you get, you got an incredible." Uh, bound on the sum of neutrino masses. Indeed, uh, that started uh, a discussion uh, that uh, is uh, lasting here today, okay, between people saying if I take this data set, I can, uh, let's say, um, I can find evidence for the normal neutrino hierarchy, okay, because we have also to choose the hierarchy uh, of the neutrino masses, and uh, other uh, people that say, no, this is too premature to get the results, this is mostly based on the statistical interpretation. And so uh, these two groups actually uh, met very recently to uh, reach an agreement if actually the Planck data can uh, really uh, constrain the normal hierarchy or not. This is a picture of, of the meeting between the two groups. And <laughs> you, can, you can see that for sure they sooner or later they will reach an agreement on that. I must say that I'm more on the... <laughs> <laughs> on the side, of course, this is also organized here, <laughs> of, the, of this normal hierarchy, of the fact that actually we are not really constraining the normal hierarchy, because uh, essentially there is this problem. Okay? Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the bounds, uh, you see uh, we are using uh, data points uh, at a combination when the temperature of the CB uh, was around 0.3 electron volt, and uh, we are bounding uh, the masses uh, uh, that uh, on neutrino below 0.1 TV. So how is this possible? Okay, how we can place using CMB data such incredible strong limit? Because in principle, the primary isotropies are uh, an epoch where the temperature was just 0.3 electron volt. The solution is CMB lensing because I'm not just measuring cosmic microgram isotropies at the combination. I have some information also from the late universe. I have a distribution of dark matter. This dark matter has an effect on the uh, path made by the photons from the last, uh, the scattering to us. Okay? So there is distortion on the of the CMB sky due to the presence of fluctuation in dark matter, <coughs> linear fluctuation between us and the last scattering. So these are very small fluctuations. Okay? And what is the main effect? There is an effect on the angular spectrum. 
there is a smearing of the oscillation in the angular power spectrum. Here you see these are two models, one with uh, um, lensing, with this effect of lensing, another one without lensing. So you see there is an effect that is practically zero, well, uh, I would say 400, so with W map alone we couldn't really measure this, but if you go to up to 1000, you see the effect is about 6%, so we can measure this uh, with Planck. Okay, and essentially it's this lensing that is letting us to put these extremely good bounds on the sound of neutrino masses. So, because uh, essentially if you have a more massive neutrino, then you have a more energy neutrino, and the neutrino of about 1 EV, they don't form structure, so you have a less structure, more massive neutrino, higher is the omega in massive neutrino, less structure you have in the universe, and of course less in the lens. Okay? So, thanks to Lensing, I can check the structure between me and the Pascal examples. So, but the point is that, okay, there was this poss there is a possibility of measuring Lensing also uh, in another way by using the uh, four point correlation function, the so called high spectrum of the cosmic microwave ground. This is probably the most, uh, I would say, the most important result from Planck. Because thanks to this uh, measurement of the tri spectrum, <coughs> they managed to uh, map the distribution of dark matter. This is an uh, <laughs> angular distribution of dark matter in the universe. Okay, so this is really impressive. This picture is, is starting to show you the distribution of dark matter thanks to lensing. The point is the following so, from Planck data, from temperature data, I have this very impressive strong upper limit on the sum of the mass. But if I add this uh, lensing uh, from the three point correlation function, you see I have uh, a weaker limit. Okay, so I have two data sets, I combine the data sets, and I decrease <laughs> the sensitivity. So it means there is a tension. Okay, it means that this data set doesn't agree with flat angular space. Okay, and the reason is uh, essentially that uh, we have too much uh, lensing in the angular power spectrum. You can parameterize uh, the amount of lens in the angular power spectrum by this AL parameter. AL1 is what you expect in lambda CDM. If, uh, if different from one, so you have a variation. And the value from uh, uh, Planck is uh, an indication for a value larger than one at 2.5 standard deviation. So essentially, in the angular power spectrum, you see more lensing, and more lensing means that uh, you have a better uh, constraint on the sum of neutrino masses than what you would have obtained in the standard lambda CDM. Okay, so there is an anomaly in the Planck data that is forcing to a better result. Okay, so we should not be happy about this result because uh, it is due to an anomaly. Okay, it's not coming from, uh, <laughs> from the precision of the data. Okay, it's coming from an anomaly. Okay, <coughs> and what I want to show you is that there is also some connection between this anomaly and the polarization a large angular scale. Okay? So, for example, if you take uh, all the whole data set, okay, this is Planck without uh, data on a large angular scale from polarization and also from temperature, you see there is uh, no, no problem. Okay? A lens is compatible with one, okay? in between one sigma. Of course, this is not straight connection, but what I mean is that still, this, lower, uh, this uh, large angular scale polarization seems to have an effect on the anomalies in the Planck uh, results. Okay. And uh, so what about, uh, okay, I'm finishing. The chairman is getting nervous. I was hoping that <laughs> <laughs> of having a more relaxed chairman but the contrary. <laughs> okay. Despite the uh, your friendship with the chairman, despite his definitely doesn't want to talk more. So, uh, okay, I will conclude. And what I'm saying is, let's look now at another data set. And what we found is that uh, actually, and that's what is really interesting, if you combine the other data set uh, than Planck, you might have uh, not only uh, values of uh, masses above point electron volt compatible with the data, but you start also to have some indication from a neutrino mass around. 0.5, 0 0.6 electron volt, electron volt. Okay, so this anomaly could also uh, erase a possible detection of the neutrino mass. And especially it's interesting if you go 
to, uh, to a larger data set in parameter space because in this case, okay, you have uh, also indication for the neutrino mass, but the point, in, the point, the point I want to make is the following, okay, just this and then I conclude. Uh, we know that if you take the map data and if you uh, let the neutrino mass to vary, there is an anticorrelation. So it means that uh, if you have a neutrino mass, a large neutrino mass, you need a lower upper constant. Okay? This is the anticorrelation. But if you move from lambda CDM to an extended model where you vary other parameters like the running of the spectral index, the equation of state uh, of the dark energy, you see this is the correlation. The anticorrelations can be a correlation. Okay? So by including <laughs> the, in this extra parameter space now the um, risk value on the upper parameter, on the upper constant, okay, you now have a, a, a determination of the neutrino mass. Okay? So it means that in, <laughs> in an extended parameter space you can solve the upper tension, but not all. In that case, the upper constraint can indicate a neutrino mass around 0.5 from both the sample. So it's just tell you that we have to be careful in considering what is the parameter space. Okay, so these are my conclusion and I stop here. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. The problem with the helium regression is not that there is too much stuff there, but that there is too little given the large size of our uncertainties. Almost every point is within one single regression line, which cannot be right. Okay. If you I am not an expert then. Okay. I'm grateful for this talk. <coughs> okay. Right. okay. So, so we had some discussion on the four data points and sort of really resolve how potential have a high end type of right? So, so you were talking about removing four data points, resolving bubble tension, having an effect on the Is that you don't really resolve the other tension. I mean, you, I, you I, prevent I, the, some of the solutions to the other I'm sure you know my particle physics hat. Okay. And I was going to say that micro has constraints, there are neutrinos. So that, that sort of, is this not a, is that not real that bad? And then also the, the question then is, we have precision calculations of N effect of the QBD. What would, you know, suppose we did have N effect, what would we do? Theoretically, go back and get that. You know, the new number. Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, sorry, when I say neutrino for us, it's a relativistic particle, okay? It's not really the, the active neutrino property. It can be a sterile neutrino, it can be an axion, it can be uh, yeah. something, okay? 3.046, where does that come from? Come, this is, comes from the QFD3 active neutrino, from the standard model of particles. Okay, so it's a QFD. Yes. Questions? Integrated comments. Yeah. Yes. So, so if, if you have more neutrino, then uh, then you, you get less large scale structure, meaning that you probably uh, you know can uh, uh, alleviate the semi texture. Is this correct? Okay. Unfortunately, there is a, of course a, this is not a, a really like this because uh, okay you have a less structure. That's correct but uh, you have uh, to change also the other parameters. <coughs> so uh, the effect is not so dramatic, if I remember. In, uh, you seem to have actually, in some cases, a larger signal from Planck when you have the, the neutrino number. Okay. So yes, I investigated this, but it doesn't make much difference. Right. Speaking of Planck system, I have a few things you showed me that were interesting. I have actually um, I guess my general question is, what are the main systematics that you're more worried about? In, uh, in uh, the plant data, yeah. okay, for sure there is uh, polarization on a large angular scale, and uh, yeah, that's it. We just, let's move here, okay. The problem of Planck, uh, if, uh, if I can summarize the point, you see, the problem is on large angular scale, here too, okay, this is the, <laughs> the well-known <laughs> problem of the anomalies at large angular scale here, and also D, we don't use D here at large angular scale, 
here, which should we believe on this that one is probably yes, but I, I, I'm actually happy that it is the new satellite light bear not coming in seven years that actually we measure better, better uh, frequency resolution this region, okay? Because this region is the most problematic one. Why, why large uh, Because we have a few data points, essentially because uh, not the and also the foregrounds from the galaxy are more important. And, uh, yeah. So if you look at the T panel, the large scales, the line that goes through them seems to be a good time. This is not the yeah, session. That's also another problem that the temperature, this power spectrum, okay, it is slight in tension. The polarization spectra are slight in tension, you can see also here, with the temperature. Now, <laughs> the point is that if you add these, uh, you are more consistent with one to see. Yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you might say, why you did you add it? Because you add these and then you go in the direction that is more consistent. But this is my impression, okay? But, uh, okay, what I want to say is the most safe, the safest data set, okay, in my opinion, is this one. It's the temperature on. Uh, on small angular scale, this one starts to be less safe, and uh, we might have some, uh, some discrepancies. Okay, the level between two and three and sigmas. Okay, so that's the one. So, so you see, well, if, if you have a theory, nobody believes in that theory apart from the person that made it. If you have an experiment, everybody believes in the experiment apart from the person that made it. <laughs> <laughs> no, what <laughs> plan has that? <laughs> I mean, it's dead. The point is that I believe the most, 99 percent of the people in Planck uh, say, "No, this data is correct. We don't have at least yeah, yeah. one percent must now say that we get." Yeah. <laughs> now, what I'm saying anyway, these are fluctuations. There are systematics. These systematics are not able uh, to change uh, the other constant from 67 to 73. Okay, they might increase a little bit, but they might hide uh, the heavier energy that uh, the memory was. Uh, is this the 11th commandment? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Comments? If not, thank you. Thank you.